Thank you, uh, Matthew. It's, a, it's an honor to be a uh, moderator in this panel. It's a role that I generally don't uh, play very much. Uh, people think I'm a more an instigator than a moderator. Uh, but I have uh, here uh, two uh, distinguished uh, experts of the Berlusconi phenomenon in Italy. I will not go through the long bio, but let me tell you uh, a couple of things that are quite important. The first one is Giovanni Rossini is uh, a professor of uh, uh, contemporary uh, history at uh, the University of uh, Louis in Rome and has written a, a book about Berlusconism uh, and, uh, is in an historical perspective. And um, uh, Beppe Savagnini is probably the most uh, famous uh, journalist uh, in Italy. Um, in, when he, in 2012, was trying to get into the Democratic Convention in Chicago, um, he said he was a, a, a writer for Corriere della Sera they did not know what Corriere della Sera was, uh, is the leading Italian, it's like the New York Times of Italy. And then he said, oh, uh, at the time, now he has many more, the Times said, I have a half a million followers on Twitter, and they opened the door. Uh, so, uh, but in the, not only has it now 1.1 million followers on Twitter, uh, but he has also written extensively about, uh, about Berlusconi, and now he directs the, basically the New York Times magazine uh, of, of Italy. And, uh, you know, it's not uh, easy uh, to be a journalist of that kind and not to be friendly uh, with the power to be. So I think that uh, it's something that uh, we should appreciate uh, in particular. So um, our goal here is uh, not to be too Italian, but to, to project uh, uh, the Berlusconi phenomenon in a broader context. So I want to just uh, uh, give a fact, which uh, I don't know how sort of known or unknown is, but I think is fundamental that the um, entering of Berlusconi in politics was an amazing feature from every point of view. Uh, if you think that uh, Trump's success in the election uh, was amazing because he started from nothing, uh, Berlusconi did much, much more because uh, the situation in, uh, when he started in 93 uh, was very similar to the situation in Brazil today. It was uh, the institutions were crumbling under sort of uh, uh, a lot of corruption investigation. Um, and within nine months, he started a party from zero and won an election. So that, that was uh, an, an amazing uh, thing to, to do. Now, the first question I would like uh, uh, the panelists to, to discuss, because I think it's important, to what extent this was the result of a exceptional personality, because whether we love him or hate him, I think we have to recognize that Berlusconi is exceptional in many dimensions, um, of an exceptional personality, of a, an Italian characteristic, etc. To what extent um, Berlusconi was um, a product of his time, was a product of the socio-economic context that was prevailing in Italy in 93, 94 when he started, and to some extent is still prevailing today. So why don't we start with Giovanni? What is your view on, on that uh, dichotomy? Okay. Very many thanks, uh, Luigi, for your introduction, for inviting me. Very many thanks to Matthew and to the, to the institutions that have organized uh, this, this day of reflection on plutocratic populism. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think that Berlusconi is an outcome more than of socioeconomic conditions, is an outcome of political conditions. And uh, in order to understand why, uh, overnight, basically, he created a political party and won the elections and became prime minister of Italy in 1994, I think we must understand what were, which were the circumstances within which all of these happened. And those circumstances were the circumstances of an utter delegitimation of politics, political parties, and professional politicians. So it is impossible to understand why Berlusconi won the elections without uh, looking at what the alternatives were and the fact that politics as an activity, as a specific activity with its own rules, its own set of uh, habits, and its autonomy, had been completely destroyed and defeated uh, by the 1992-1993 judicial investigations. Otherwise, we, if we don't take this into account, we will never understand why Berlusconi had in front of him this enormous political space that he could fill, and why he filled that space in the way he did 
That is, as an entrepreneur, as a manager, as someone that was very different from a professional politician. Uh, now, why all this? Why this happened? Of course, I mean, this is a, a long story. I'll, I'll promise I'll make it very, very short, but just to, to make you understand what happens in Italy in the early 90s. Uh, I think we have two major premises that we must bear in mind. The first is that Italy is a hyper-political country. Politics in Italy has always been extremely important. Uh, so a very important symbolic role. Uh, Italian newspapers are filled with domestic politics, much more than newspapers in other parts of the world. And of course, also very relevant material presence of politics and the state and the public in Italy. So politics is relevant, and that's the first major premise. The second major premise is that the Cold War in Italy had a very relevant impact. Italy is the country where possibly in Europe the Cold War had the most relevant impact bar possibly Germany, uh, even though the impact in Germany was very different. Uh, so very relevant politics and very relevant impact of the Cold War. <clears throat> Three less, let's say, minor premises, which is First, since the 1960s, these very relevant and heavy politics stopped being able to manage the country. So in a way, there was the idea that politics was very relevant, very heavy, very demanding, but not delivering what it should have delivered. So unable to really govern the country and solve the problems of the country. Possibly this, this wasn't right, but that was the perception. A second minor premise, <clears throat> Since the late 1970s, we have a very relevant growth of the myth of civil society. This happened in very different ways, but the, the bottom message, the bottom line was uh, civil society is a solution, politics is a problem. So, and there were mythical elements in this idea of civil society as the repository of all which is good, whereas politics was the repository of all which is evil. So a very sharp dichotomy there. Third minor premise, uh, given that their ability to govern the country and their legitimacy of political parties was growing ever weaker, political parties could keep the country under control only thanks to the use of public resources, which led to a huge public debt being piled up and to, of course, a significant increase of systemic corruption. So let's wave all this together. Politics is very important, but is perceived as being unable to solve problems. Civil society is a mythical entity able to solve all things and all problems. Systemic corruption, public debt, and, uh, and the Cold War is relevant. Now, 1989 comes, the Cold War is over, so the impact, the let's say, the ability of the Cold War to shape Italian politics disappears. Italy is losing her monetary sovereignty because of European integration. So the use of public expenditure in order to build political consensus is no longer possible. So we have a kind of historical turning point that opens up the possibility for the judges to start entering into the corruption of the public system. And because of all the reasons that I've very briefly listed, public opinion goes after the prosecutors. This is what we want. Politics is delegitimized, it doesn't work, it's too heavy, it's corrupt, and we have a ready-made solution, which is civil society. So it's enough to tap into the magical qualities of civil society to have all these sorted out. And there comes the magician. Terrific entrepreneur, very successful, media tycoon, the supposedly best product of civil society. I would say the self-styled best product of civil society. Of course, this can be discussed very, very much. But <clears throat> if politics is the root of all evils, and civil society the source of all goods, then a person coming from civil society, such as Berlusconi, successful entrepreneur, 
can solve all Italy's problems in three ways. By creating a non-political public elite, so Italy must not be governed by politicians, but be governed by people coming from civil society, of which Berlusconi is the best example and leader. So entrepreneurs, professionals, university professors, if university, whether university professors are the best part of civil society, of course, is very much open to discussion. Uh, managers, so a non-political public elite, a non-political political elite, one can say with an oxymoron, a non-political managerial logic, so we don't need the state to be run according to political logic, but we need managerial elements. So managers exploiting a managerial logic, not a political logic. So no longer backroom maneuvers, but efficiency. And reducing the size of the state, of course, giving more breathing space to civil society, and uh, following the example of what supposedly Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher done in the Anglo-Saxon world in the 1980s. Uh, these two figures are very much present into Berlusconi <coughs> rhetoric. The idea we can do what they have done. It's still 1993, 94, so the memory of the 1980s. We must bear this in mind also when comparing Berlusconi with Trump. Berlusconi is a child of the 1980s. Trump is a child of the post 9-11 world. It's it's very, very different worlds, of course. Of course, uh, there is the risk that this entrepreneur will mostly look after his own business and don't give a damn about Italy and the interest of Italians. But the basic answer then was, what have politicians done? So also politicians have just looked after their own interests. So the answer to that was, he will look after his own interest, maybe, but this is what all others have done, but at least it's going to be efficient. And he is so rich that possibly he will not have the need to corrupt and to steal like the poor politicians, upstarts coming from nothing and just wanting to become politicians in order to enrich themselves. He's already rich. So he does not need to enrich himself. Of course, you can always, we can always grow richer, but I think this is the beginning of an explanation why Berlusconi won. This was the, let's say, the consequence of the delegitimation of politics and of the political sphere. If we don't get that into account, we'll never understand him. Uh, thank you. Beppe, can you sort of provide your view on this? And in particular, uh, I'm intrigued by this uh, uh, aspect of uh, Berlusconi as a member of the civil society, because uh, um, I was already living abroad at the time, uh, but I didn't see him as a member of the civil society, sort of as a, as a successful businessman or the image of a successful businessman, but not as a member of the civil society. And in particular, why do you think Berlusconi ran for, for president? Because uh, there could have been a lot of other people that uh, could have done it. Why him? I'll answer you. Uh, first of all, thanks, Professor Stevenson, Professor Manning for the introduction, and, and to you, Luigi, for inviting me here. Uh, let me ask, uh, I have to tell you a story, but before I tell you a story, I have to answer your question, because I'm a journalist. I don't like when I ask questions and people no, talk go about ahead. something tell else. Story for, no, no, tell I have to so answer. Well that you can go ahead. Uh, no, East, uh, Berlusconi entered politics for self-preservation of his own business. There is no doubt about that. Even the people working with him and close to him admit that. But soon enough, he decided he really enjoyed that. That gave him the exposition, the, the pleasure, the popularity always craved. More than, po more than football, more than television, more than real estate. And uh, bear in mind that every successful populist, not only, uh, sorry, uh, politicians, not only the populist plutocrats we're here to talk and learn about from each other, I think that every extremely uh, successful politician it's a psychiatric case. 
I mean, all of them. Sure. If you are really successful in politics, you, ha you need a good... I mean, it's a, if you are a regular person, you don't become a star in politics anywhere. I don't think that the Margaret Thatcher was r a, a regular woman. I don't think... Even the, 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 the Democrat, you need to be obsessed with yourself. You want to... to, to 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 achieve something you have something inside that helps you to go and and get over difficulties and, and i mean some of the disillusions and humiliation and defeats and embarrassment that any politician has to suffer will crush any of us here they don't they just smile boing and up again <laughs> that's my my story okay I wrote a book about Berlusconi. I, I'm not a political journalist, although I've been writing for The Economist, and The Economist is a, is a, is a great magazine. They actually is a newspaper, as we like to say. And we, the polit political correspondent happened to be in Milan, and the economic and finance correspondence in Rome. You say, it doesn't make sense? In Italy, it does. So I, I was at a safe distance from politics, but I cover Italian politics from 96 to 2003 for The Economist, and for Correa della Sera, and so on. I wrote occasional about politics, but as an Italian, I was very interested. So I never wrote books. I wrote 16 books. Uh, two of them, luckily enough, were extremely successful and popular in this country. That was uh, probably my best achievement as a writer. And by, I wrote only one book about politics, and I wrote about a book about Berlusconi, because I realized that if you really learn and study Berlusconi, you learn a lot about a country. If you study a policy, I think you can learn a lot about America if you study Donald Trump. It's not true that America, current America, is Donald Trump. It's not true, and I got really angry when people say, oh, Italy, you're all Bill's. No, but you really, it tells you something. And I think it's interesting here today, and I think it's going to be really interesting from our uh, uh, friends from Thailand and elsewhere and South Africa to learn what can we learn about a country if we study this phenomenon. My story, the book came out in 2010, was La Pancia degli Italiani. That's for you, by the way. <laughs> uh, it was translated in 2011, and the, and the title became Mamma Mia, Berlusconi's Italy, Explained for Posterity and Friends Abroad. If you think you're dreaming on a Saturday morning in Harvard that you're seeing a sitting prime minister at the time who's making a pass at Botticelli's Primavera, it's true. That's exactly what he's doing on the, on the cover. Do you see it? And this caused me prob problem and, uh, at Logan Airport. I'll tell you, it's a great story. I flew in for my book tour. I started in Boston at MIT. Uh, then I went to New York. Uh, I, I had planned to go to Chicago, New York, and end up in Washington at Georgetown uh, University. I had four or five stops. And I came in, I flew into, and there was, Logan is not, I was talking to, to, in my experience, it happens to so many academic journalists that they, you stop, they stop you and ask you questions everywhere, but in Logan a little bit more, in my experience. And anyway, they ask me a lot of questions. Are you a writer? Yes, I'm a journalist and writer. Why are you traveling on an I visa? Because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a journalist, a, a full-time journalist. That's me. You can look me up. You find, yes, we, we know who you are, but why are you here with a book? Because, as you know, sometimes journalists write books. <laughs> and I'm here anyway. And th things were going reasonably well. And say, okay, what book? Show me your book. <laughs> I pulled out my book. And I told the uh, office, and they said, what is it about? <laughs> it's about my prime minister. You look at me, it cannot be your prime minister. <laughs> Three hours at Logan Airport. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I had the gray line. In fact, my book tour was done. Everywhere the reaction was yours. People were laughing at the Logan story. In the end, I got in with my book. <laughs> uh, what happened between the fall in t of 2011? Actually, when I, while I was doing my book tour, Berlusconi lost his job because the, the, the early November 2011, things were falling apart. There was sexual scandal that were very important. We may go back into that for Berlusconi downfall, the economy was crumbling, and so anyway, he was pushed out, gently pushed out. By whom and how, doesn't matter now, but it was, so I was ev everywhere, I was going to book, I was like a rock star because all my American colleagues wanted to know 
you know, this, what is happening to Berlusconi? You're writing a book at the right time, uh, which doesn't happen all the time to a journalist, but it happened. And uh, what happened between those days of the fall of 2011 and the fall of 2017? Six years. And in between, we had the rise of populist movement across Europe, in Italy the Five Star Movement, we had Brexit, we had the election of Donald Trump. So much had happened. Berlusconi is, as you rightly say, is, is back. I don't think he'll, ever, he'll become prime minister again for several reasons. One of them is the electoral law. One of them is going to be 81. He's not in great shape. I don't think he f physically and, and, and uh, mentally is, is up. And I, somehow I don't think he really wants the job. He loves to be a kingmaker. That's my view. But in six years what happened is this, that uh, climate change, political climate change. You know what climate change is? Well, the real one. There is also a political climate change. Berlusconi was frozen like a mammoth. And then political climate change happened, and all of a sudden he found himself free. Here I am again. He did nothing to come back into Italian politics. He is now back as a, one of the main characters because it, the, sort of the, the, the ice around him melted. And, and what happened? And it's, it's, it always, uh, always, uh, or often actually, happens with these characters. What happened is that other people melt the hours for you. Berlusconi did nothing to come back. All around him, there was a situation, and uh, we'll go into that maybe later if you want, or maybe not, but he did nothing. Berlusconi is very different. He's not only the son of the 1980s, his style is, is 19, very much 1980s. Berlusconi knows that trick of the plutocrat, uh, shows the style of a populist, but has the goal of a moderate. That's very important. Uh, I wrote a piece for the New York Times and an op-ed in the, in the fall of 2015, two years ago, what Italy can teach America about Donald Trump. And I say, look, the two are very different, but if you do these, 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 you end up with Donald Trump in the White House. I have to say that America, especially American media, did exactly what they were not supposed to do. Transforming him into obsession, take him literally, but not seriously, while these people should be taken seriously, but not literally, and so on and so forth. So it, it was for an Italian, it was easier to see coming, but it's very different. I also, when Donald Trump was elected, I had a second story in the, I, had, I write every month for the New York Times, I had a second story, and, this, and we had a line, which had a line, and it explained my third point. So, he knows the tricks of the populist, he shows the style of a, of a uh, sorry, he knows the trick of a plutocrat. He, sh he shows the style of a populist, but he has the goals of a moderate. Berlusconi is no extremist. Berlusconi listens to some people around him. Berlusconi likes America and likes the European Union. Uh, I never voted for him, as you probably have imagined, but you have to, to, ad to, to admit uh, that much. Compare in my New York Times story in the in uh, in uh, 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 late last year, the line went: compared to Donald Trump, Silvio Berlusconi is Winston Churchill, <laughs> and people laughed. And of course, it's a paradox. But I'll briefly I'll tell you why he got elected because I think that's what we are here to learn from each other about. Uh, I'll just read the title. I put 10 reasons why Berlusconi was successful. I think some of these reasons apply definitely to Donald Trump and some of the other populist plutocrats. Not all of them, but just I'll go very quickly through them. There are 10 factors where these people are successful. Number one, the human factor. What do most Italians think about Silvio Berlusconi? He's just like us. That's very important. He's one of us. Number two, the divine factor. Mr. Berlusconi knows that praising the church helps most Italians feel less guilty about not going to mass or systematically ignoring seven of the Ten Commandments. Work out which ones. <laughs> Three, the Robinson factor. Every Italian feels he or she 
stands alone against the world, or if not the world, the neighbors. We take pride in surviving socially and economically. It shows how resourceful we are. Much, uh, if you change into, you could r easily say every American feels that he or she stands alone against the world, or if not the world, the neighbors. We take pride, you take pride in surviving socially and economically. It shows how resourceful we are. So if you see someone who's been who the establishment refused, refusing and attacking the way Berlusconi was attacked or Trump was attacked is actually exactly what they needed to become popular with and, and have the Robinson factor. So uh, me against the world. Number four, the Truman factor. Truman, the Truman show, Berlusconi through his media, that doesn't apply to Trump, built a kind of parallel world that helped a lot. The Hoover factor. You remember Hoover? The Hoover salesman, the best salesman in the world, legends. Berlusconi is basically the best salesman I ever seen in action. He could sell anything to anyone at any time. He comes into this place, he'll sell the Harvard Law School to you. <laughs> Say, but it's ours. You wake up. What do you do? doesn't matter. He's an amazing salesman. He knows the psychology, he can read into the people. He remembers the name and the first name of the, uh, the people that he met. Actually, he studies. When he was an entrepreneur, he always learned by heart the names and the birth and the date of birth of the secretaries, PA assistant, the personal assistant, or the people he was interested in. So he would send flowers, not to the powerful person he was interested in, but to, to his PA or her PA, most of the time his PA. So this person, most of the time a young a woman or a young woman, loved Berlusconi and Berlusconi had access. Sometimes he even managed to get, I'm not making this up, that this is a well-known story. If he was really interested in getting to you, he would talk to this PA, but the, by them it was a great fan of his, find out when you were, when these tycoon politicians, whatever, was traveling to Rome by train, found out which place, which city he was sitting in in the train, book in, uh, a seat right, did you know this, right in front of him, and pretend it was a coincidence. Look! You know, oh, no, the minister, you know, was sitting in front of each other, incredible. And the poor man for three hours had Berlusconi in front of him selling <laughs> his stuff. And Berlusconi by Rome, he had sold him the word. He didn't do that all the time, but I'm not making this up. It's a well-known story. Now he doesn't need to, but that's his, how he, he started. He's a great salesman. Quickly, the Zelig factor. All politicians need to be able to identify with the, uh, with the other people. Few are capable of actually turning into them. Uh, Silvio Berlusconi is, is uh, a, a, a women's man among the ladies, a youthful with the young, wise with the old, a night owl with a night set, a worker at the workplace, entrepreneurial with the business community, youthful with the young, and so on and so forth. He, he was like Zelig. You remember the film, Woody Allen film? Now, he, he, you couldn't believe that he would go into a farm and find and tell about his great grandfather who was a farmer and start talking about and, and of course he knew nothing about that but he was so convincing and he did that to an extraordinary level of of charm and and, and very often he would prepare himself uh, the harem factor silvio berlusconi obsession with women and uh, uh, that's interesting. Let me read you the first line. Silvio Berlusconi's obsession with women, an open secret in his business circle and then in Rome's corridors of power, became publicly public knowledge in 2009 when he attended this very young girl's Noemi Letizia 18th birthday party and reports emerged about his soiree at Villa Certosa and Palazzo Grazioli. At first, he denied the charges, but then he admitted them. Th his best line, are you, am I faithful? Frequently. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, he played along. I'm no saint. Uh, 
the revelation left him unscathed. He lost his wife, but not his electoral base. Lots of Italians who prefer self-indulgence to self-discipline admit that Mr. Berlusconi does what they can only dream of doing. And that again, Berlusconi is the, uh, there is a commander in chief and uh, there is also like a, a forgiver in chief. Can I say that? Uh, can I say that? So Berlusconi, made a science of forgiving us for sins, some of which we have not yet uh, committed. So he, he would say, whatever you do is good. And instead of preaching, which most voters don't like, he would have that approach. Uh, I have two more. So That's important, I think, applies to other countries. The Medici factor. Your Medici was the famous Florentine, the family that uh, under which all the, the Renaissance in Florence happened, were the most interesting years. Uh, and that's important. Uh, Italy, I think, created, invented two forms of government, the Comune and the Signoria. The Signoria is well known, is the Medici, is there, it actually created the Renaissance. Most other we imported. Either we inherited from the past or we imported. Parliamentary democracy we didn't invent it, and many others. But the Signoria is very much Italian. And the idea of the Il Signore is someone who takes care of his own business but also takes care of, it's good to you, and it's better to, to, to be liked by him, is very much part of the Italian psychology. And Berlusconi tapped exactly into that. This tradition of having a signore, which is, is after all, is not bad, and he takes care of his own dreams, but also is yours, and it's good to be, to be in his uh, favor. And the final one is, The TINA factor. TINA is an acronym. There is no alternative. Margaret Thatcher used to that. And I I'll, I'll want to read you something that a, a right-wing columnist wrote and I put in my book. And I think it explains a lot. Listen, it said, what is the alternative? Listen to this. In reality, he writes, his name is Marcello Veneziani. You invented Berlusconi. He is a child of the demonization that has dogged him since he took the political field. He is a child of your unremitting denigration, your scorn for all he does, all he says, all he wears, all he thinks. He is a child of your intolerance for the only boss whom, whom, whom you have attend, attacked in recent decades, perhaps with the approval of, of other bosses. He is a child of the bad government, of your governments, the vacuity of your leaders, and the cultural arrogance of your intellectual, judicial, and media caste. He is the child of everything you ascribe to him. And I think there is quite a lot of truth in there. So now, uh, to end my, uh, my, first, uh, uh, my first part on Berlusconi, is now back. Some of these of these elements don't apply anymore. I explain how he came into power and how and why he lasted for 20 years back and forth. He won three elections. It's very important to remember. Three times. It is true that he's got the media factor. We described that that he creates the, and so the media helped him. But the media alone do not explain Berlusconi electoral success. The reason why he's back now is completely different. Berlusconi, strangely enough, and that may be another impersonation of his uh, Zelig persona, Berlusconi is now seen as reassuring. So the revolutionary of the 1990 has becoming a reassuring factor in Italian politics. So when the real aggressive populist, he's a moderate, and he realized that the best thing you can sell, the master salesman realized what do people want now? They want reassurance. And here I am again, Silvio Berlusconi, in his late, latest impersonation. Thank you. So, thank you uh, f for this. Uh, uh, you're mentioning the, the Tina factor, there is no alternative. And uh, what I would like to, to discuss more is, is uh, um, it's not like... Uh, Italy found out it was a plutocracy under Berlusconi. I think that uh, even under the previous regime, uh, there were a lot of influential 
people that uh, got a lot of benefits from the government uh, and uh, they did not feel the need to be so directly involved. And, uh, and this is important because when we're going to talk about uh, Thailand in the next panel, uh, Taksim was part of the elite, of the, of the plutocratic elite in Thailand, but at some point he felt the need to become a, a, a leader. So the question is, uh, first of all, what is, you describe correctly, Giovanni, the uh, corruption part, but I don't think, uh, uh, at least in my view, and, and uh, feel free to say I'm wrong, you did not describe correctly uh, the elite prevailing at the time. Uh, in a sense, the civil society, in my view, was not Berlusconi. Uh, there was a leftist component that basically self-appointed as the civil society. It was trying to uh, uh, change the world, um, but supported by other plutocrats. In a sense, uh, I know this is a bit provocative, but what is the difference between uh, Carlo de Benedetti and, and Berlusconi? They both have a media empire. They both are politically involved. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Carlo De Benedetti is the number one uh, uh, re uh, in subscriber of uh, the, the first um, member of the Democratic Party in, in Italy. And uh, they uh, both receive enormous favor from the government. Uh, the, the second license for cellular phone was given to uh, uh, De Benedetti basically for free by the incumbent government. So. It, the, the, the system was a plutocratic system to begin with. Uh, what, what, is the, what Berlusconi made a difference and, and why the, the alternative could not be created? Why the alternative is so, so weak? Um, in, in my view, what it took a Hillary Clinton to make Trump win and it took an Italian uh, left to make Berlusconi win. So in, to what extent uh, the problem is not just on one side, but is a much broader uh, problem of society. Yep. Uh, yes, I think this is one of the explanations as well. Uh, when, we, when it comes to Berlusconi's conflict of interests, Berlusconi defending his own business, Berlusconi being a person that you know is exploiting the Italian state, uh, once again, one of the perceptions of the voters and one of the reasons why the voters say we don't care about that, we are going to, some voters, of course, not everyone, but at times the majority of Italians <laughs> say we don't care about that because the perception is that, you know, kind of, you know, a night in which our cows are black. So the problem is a systemic problem. The problem is that we have... Um, a total lack of boundary maintenance between the business, business, business community and the state. As I said before, Italy is a hyper-political country and uh, the, the state intervention into the economy has been one of the uh, crucial elements of the Italian economic development after 1945, after the Second World War. And this created a number of cross-cutting networks, commitments uh, that make it very difficult to say this is, we were speaking with, with Luigi, uh, you know, th this idea that there is a good part of Italy somewhere which you can use to change the country, the handle, the handle by which you can get the pen and take it out of the fire. As a matter of fact, there are no handles in Italy which doesn't mean that they are all equal, but it means that the system is a very complicated system in which all business, as or many businesses, have connection with the state, and the, the chronic capitalism and the relationship between politics and business is, is, is very deeply entrenched and very complicated. Berlusconi was certainly one part of all of this, but Luigi was mentioning uh, Carlo De Benedetti. I mean, what we get at the end of the 1980s and the early 1990s is a major media war, which Corriere della Sera, as is well known, was a major part. It was a war to control the Corriere della Sera. Uh, and in, many, very way, in very many ways, this was perceived by the Italian public as a war of power. 
in which Berlusconi was one of the partners, one of the persons battling the war, fighting the war, but this was not about being good or being evil. This was about uh, a power war among figures that are, were trying to get power and control of the media. So this is, I think, part of the story. So if you ask the, uh, the standard Berlusconi voter, you know, how can you vote for a person that made his money out of public favors, that has a lot of trials because of his connection, because of bribery, corruption, his connection with the state, the basic answer you get is this is what all entrepreneurs had to do in Italy. In Italy, if you want to do enterprise, this is what you must do. And this is one of the reasons why many small entrepreneurs were in favor of Berlusconi, because to a certain extent, they did that. Now, whether they did that because they were obliged to do that or because it was in their interest, so whether they were in a way, in a way you know, receiving something from the public sector or bribing the public sector is not of concern to me now. What I'm saying is about perceptions. Voters were perceiving that what Berlusconi did was what all entrepreneurs had to do back in the 1970s and 1980s. You needed to have the favor of politicians. They all did that. So why should we blame him for that? And that's one of the, of the reasons, I believe, uh, why many people voting for Berlusconi did not perceive this uh, as a problem. <clears throat> By the way, there is a brilliant book about the war for the control of the media in the late 80s and early 90s, written by Franco de Benedetti, which is Carlo de Benedetti's brother, but which is very much super partes in that. It's a very interesting book. It was written by the brother of one of the major protagonists of the battle, but in a way reading all these exactly as, as, a, as a power struggle. Uh, the other crucial element is <clears throat> the alternatives. And this is the, the Tina factor. What is the alternative? Now, let's get back to 1993, 1994. So, March 1994, an election. Now, all the historical parties from the center right to the center left in Italy, the governing parties, the parties that have governed Italy for decades, don't exist any longer because the judges have destroyed them. So, huge part of the electorate doesn't, doesn't have their historical reference points. They don't know who they should vote for. On the one hand, there is Berlusconi in alliance with the post-fascists. We shouldn't forget that. And with the uh, ethno-nationalist party of the Northern League. So right wing. But what's on the other side? On the other side, we have got uh, the post-communists. The, the kernel, the core of the Italian left is made by the post-communists. And what are the post-communists and how are the post-communists perceived by Italian voters? Because the Italian voters, their overwhelming majority, was made of anti-communists. So one of the crucial issues is that the post-communists weren't able to convince the voters that they had changed. So for many voters, the thing was, communism is no longer, is of course 1994, so five years after the, the, the downfall of the Berlin Wall, communism is no longer, but the communists are still there. And what are the communists? The communists is a power group, is people that manage power ruthlessly, this is the perception of the anti-communists. I'm not saying that this is true. I'm saying I'm putting myself in the shoes of the voter. So these, they haven't changed their personnel. So yes, communism is no longer, but these are still the people that were in favor of the Soviet Union and the communist bloc. 
in, in a very complicated way, starting from, from the late 1960s, but nonetheless, uh, they are people that have very deep roots in some regions of Italy, where they have created a very strong power system, local powers, connection with the local banks, with the local enterprises, with the cooperatives, a very strong power system that for many voters was not something good. It, was a, it worked very well, very efficient, but very suffocating as well. And final elements, which both Beppe and Luigi have already recalled, this idea that uh, we are the good ones. We are the ethical ones. We are those that can tell the Italians what is good for them. This is a corrupt country. This is a country that must be, uh, in a way, corrected, transformed. And we are those who can morally, ethically teach the Italians how to behave. Now, this was perceived as extremely arrogant. Also because uh, all Italians knew that the post-communists were a party, a part of the corruption system of Italy. They participated to the system of illegal financing of political parties. They participated on a lower scale, on a lower level than the governing parties, but they participated. And the judges had discovered that, even though they, uh, had, had, in a way, had not discovered enough to, to get to the, uh, to the leaders of the party. But this was quite clear, that they had participated. So a party that had participated to the system of illegal financing of political parties, a party that had created very strong and deep power structures in some regions of Italy, was moralizing, arguing that they were different and pretending that they had the right to teach the Italians how to behave morally. Right or wrong, this was perceived as extremely arrogant on the part of the Italians. So not only you are patronizing us, but you don't even have the right to do that. You don't have the, the ethical stance the ethical standing for patronizing us in that way. On the other side, there was a man that was saying, come on, guys, you're good. This is a great country. This is a country full of potential. I am in no position to tell you what to do because you already know that. What I want to do is to create the conditions for you to do what you want to do, because what you want to do is good. Of course, there was no match. And, and, the, and there, are, there are brilliant books written by left-wing people. And Luca Ricolfi, Perché siamo antipatici? Why are we antipatici? There's no unpleasant. unpleasant. Or if you read the, this novel by Francesco Piccolo that won recently the Strega Prize in Italy, which is the most important literary prize, it's all about the arrogance of the left. And it's from within. These are left-wing people that, in a way, are saying, with this kind of, of way of behaving, we, would, we, we could never win the elections. Because Italians would say, come on, guys, why are you saying that? Why? And this, I, I believe, was... And, 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 uh, and Berlusconi was exactly the other the other way around. Now, of course, when Berlusconi was telling the Italians, you're good, you can do whatever you want, he was wrong. And when the left was telling the Italians, we should behave better, they were right. So I'm not saying this was right or wrong. I'm saying this created a perception on the part of the Italians that explains why Berlusconi won the elections and the left lost. And of course, uh, there is no lessons that the Americans should learn about arrogance. 
but uh, just to give you a sense, because I think that what he said is absolutely right and, and something that uh, might be shocking to many of you. So the, the, there was a cultural war in Italy after World War II, and, and the communists, that they became the post-communists, were very much part of a cultural war, uh, at least looking at history, on the wrong side of history. What later became the president of Italy, and a much revered one, is somebody that in 1956 cheered the Soviet tanks in Hungary. So this is a guy that not only was pro-Soviet Union, but was in favor of the most brutal repression that the Soviet did in... Who? in the, Who? Napolitano. Yeah, you go and, and, and look. It's, it's just this is, has been covered, but uh, it, this this is yeah. Uh, but anyway, I, I why don't you give you a version, Beppe? Well, Napolitano, as many former communists did, uh, and and chose the wrong uh, side in in his days, but he changed his mind long. I mean, we're talking sixty years ago. I understand, but well, the fact that well, people in, were in when I was born and, and in Hungary and the Soviet Union invaded, invaded Hungary, Napolitano already took a distance from that, and that it was talking six years ago. But going back to Berlusconi is interesting because uh, Berlusconi always called the left the communist. Even when the communists were disappeared, even when the communists, and our former president is one of them, even when the communists had changed, some of them had changed their mind 60 years ago, some of them 30 years ago, i never been a communist. I've been writing for a center-right uh, newspaper in, the 90, in my 12, first 12 years of my career, and you know, you know who was my publisher? Berlusconi, my mentor and the real and the real power there was Monta Indro Montanelli, who has been the grand old man of Italian journalists in the 20th century. But Berlusconi was a very uh, polite, uh, unintruding young publisher that adored Berlusconi, and never in, in a w maybe he would step in when f football, soccer. Cinema, television, and maybe some of his girls, young actresses were involved. But I was covering foreign policy. I was uh, traveling to America and to China. So for me, it was like I left when the moment Berlusconi came to us. I remember that day in January 1994, there was a broom as big as this one. He came in. He's extremely tiny. You don't know how tiny he is. Uh, and he, it's tiny. He stepped and said, look. You do, you're making a great newspaper, and now there is a war to win against the communists. You want to be with me? Now is enough. We have to use the sabra, you use the expression, not the, come si dice fioretto? The foil. foil. The words were, uh, it's not time, you're great at using the foil, now it's used to use the sabra, because now there is a political battle to be won. Are you with me? You got the money for the newspaper. You're not with me, and I resigned that afternoon because I said, if you if you work for a newspaper that is owned by a politicians, you work for a party newspaper. Period. And in fact, some of us took a different way. You know, my uh, Antonio Tajani, the current president of the European Parliament, he's he's my exactly my age, and he was one of those who decided to stick with Berlusconi because he he was one of the journalists that considered that journalism is come second to a political passion. In fact, he became a full-time politician. So I consider journalism to be something else. But Berlusconi, it is true, it's uh, it's. Someone that always used these, this. There is one factor that I left out: the Palio factor. In the Palio di Siena, do you know what it is? Of course, the Italians know, but I wonder about other people. The Palio di Siena, they run every contrada, so any any neighborhood they call contrada in Siena. They have one horse, and they run twice a year, and there is a passionate thing you could not believe if you not if you do not know Italy and Tuscany and Siena the passion that goes into the Palio di Siena the thing they like there is are two things they they are they they live for one winning the Palio with your contrada the name are Oca the goose the dragon the pa one is winning and the other, and is as exciting, is having your rival because they're all matched. 
So H1 has got a rival, is for your rival to lose. If your rival to lose, they have celebration as much as they win. So and Berlusconi perfectly represents that. He realized that there were enough Italians that he, in order to keep the communists, the former communists out, he never used former communists, he always used the word communist because he knew they will evoke sort of things in people. To, in order to keep them out, they were ready to vote for the devil. And Berlusconi is no devil. It's important. Berlusconi, at, it, at his height of his power, never went beyond 35% of the vote, ever. So one Italian out of three. That, so two out of three Italians, it, you know, I know it applies to this country as well, never voted for Berlusconi. But he's also a very smart, tactical politician. He knew how to form alliances. He knew how to bring things together, how to smooth differences, something that the center left was not re has never been good to do. And he's at it again. And that explains a lot, apart from its background and so on and so forth. And finally, I have to say that some of the things I, I said, I wrote, and I, I deeply resented about the Berlusconi years is the embarrassment. I was traveling the world uh, as a roving correspondent and a journalist, and at my Italians, at my website, uh, we had pizza all over the world with my readers to know each other. We had a Harvard Italians pizza. We have a MIT. We had in 104 cities around the world. And for 10 years, every time I would sit down, people would ask about Berlusconi, laugh about Berlusconi. I remember so many difficult and embarrassing moments. And my point is, you're talking about Italy. Berlusconi is one prime minister. I try, if you want, I try to explain how it happened. And now he's happening, but no prime minister is the exact, they represent their country, they run their country, but they are not their country. And that's very important. And it, but it's very difficult to get that notion out of people's head. In, from 1994 to 2011, for many around the world, the world is, the, the public opinion, it, we know, uh, Sometimes we know too little about our own politicians and establishments and system and the workings of government and democracy. We know very little about other countries. So I'm sure it happened to Thailand, it happened, it's happening to America now, it happens to other parts of the world. When something happened, then that's it. You, there is no opposition, there is no nuances, you're all Berlusconi. There was a difference at the time. I have to say it is true that the, sometimes the left has behave, beca behaved arrogantly, sometimes too cold, coldly, and that probably has been the problem with Hillary Clinton. Sometimes uh, there was an element of hypocrisy about things you do and you don't, don't talk about, while the populist plutocrat is warm, empathic, he admits his sin and forgives yours. That's but but it's a very smart thing because he admits his huge sins and he forgives your little sins. So every Italian who paid, I never corrupted anyone in six years of my life in Italy, just to be clear, ever, ever. But the Italians who, you know, the shopkeeper would give, you know, 50 euros to the, to the local policeman so he would can keep his car in front of his shop or something like that. The moment Berlusconi, okay, don't worry, it's not important. The, he, the, the smart thing and the very subtle thing, I forgive you for those 50 euros. Don't worry, it's, that's not important. But in a way, I buy your acquittance for me that it was 50 billion, not 50 euro. And that's the trick. I forgive you the small things, so you forgive me for the big things, and maybe you vote for me. And that exactly the psychological, uh, the psychological trick, and it works extremely well. Uh, the left, the center-left Italians, they may be antipathici, every, but uh, Romano Prodi, for instance, who's not my ideal politician, but he never brought uh, uh, prostitutes around the seats of government. And to me, it's important because it's a matter of national security and national decor. And it happened. Do you, you know the next Sorrentino movie? 
Sorrentino, the uh, the Oscar-winning movie director. He he is the author, the, the director of La Grande Bellezza, who won an Oscar. His new project is about Berlusconi's party. But Berlusconi is smart enough that he, he say, oh, I, I think it's a great idea. Let me come to the set and see what you're doing, and I give you advice. The man is extraordinarily smart. But nonetheless, I have to say that I felt deeply embarrassed. I thought there was a security problem, a decency problem, a morally problem. I know people with teenager children that had difficult time to explain to their daughters that maybe to be women and hanging around in a mini skirt and spending the night at the prime minister's office was not something that you want to do. And so, and so there is a difference, though. I think uh, I think the, the center left. What is said, the center left never managed to explain that after all there was a difference in Italy in the last 15 years. And Berlusconi was smart enough, and television here is very important. Because if you, if you have television and big newspapers, you control not the whole narrative, but enough of the narrative. There is never a moment where they can switch you off. Do you understand? For politicians, the worst thing is to be switched off. He had enough power television, radio, newspapers, magazine, and whatever, not to be switched off. Even television is important not when you win, but when you lose. Because it's like, because you float. And he's been managing to float. And now he's floating again, and he's there again, although he won't become prime minister, because he had enough mediatic power. It means that, you know, he's got a lot to offer to journalists. You need to make a choice before you say, I really don't want to play that game. So you raise uh, a lot of important points, but I want to focus uh, particularly on, on two. One, of course, is, is the media power. Um, media power that, again, I think that uh, Berlusconi at the beginning controls three TVs and, and one newspaper. But there were three TVs that were state-owned. There were a lot of newspapers that were, quote-unquote, independent. Um, but in Italy, there is a tradition that uh, medias are owned by people with an agenda. Um, one of the few things that Trump uh, said right, uh, but uh, did not get any credit, is when he said, why do you think uh, Bezos uh, bought a Washington Post? Is because he's passionate about uh, editorial stuff? No. Yes. For political power. As well. I know him recently. Not well, but reasonably well, even privately. And I tell you, there is a big element of that. He wants to prove that everybody uh, de decided that newspapers were doomed and he's smart enough to make them survive. Of course, he's a Washington Post. What you are, are about to say is true, uh, yeah, Luigi. Of, of course, but there is an element of, you know, the man is, he wants to show that, that he can do that as well. Sure. I, li like Berlusconi wanted to show that uh, he could do also politics. But uh, I think that uh, the reality is that uh, one of the major industries in Italy uh, was actually making a, a uh, was proud of never ever made a dime with a newspaper he controlled. And then if you are an industrialist and you own a newspaper for a long time and you don't make a profit, that's a problem because you're doing something else with it. And I think that that's, that's the mode of uh, Italian newspaper, but also, and, and I don't know, and I, this is what I would like to ask uh, Giovanni and, and Beppe, to what extent uh, money play a big role? Because there are uh, rumors that, uh, uh, for example, the Northern League has been uh, uh, become a, a very loyal um, ally of Berlusconi, not because of his tactful skills, but because he was financing much of their activity. And uh, there is an investigation, I don't know whether it has been dropped, but there's an investigation that he literally bought some senators in order to have a majority. He was short of a couple of them. And um, it went uh, not with the uh, uh, pork barrel policy, policy like in the United States, but with the old-fashioned sort of uh, uh, greenbacks. And um, so to what extent uh, both the, the media uh, influence and the money influence were crucial in the Berlusconi phenomenon to start and also to continue for so long. Totally crucial, both. Both television and money, of course. But first of all, now, now once again, imagine Italy late 1993. So the governing parties have disappeared. The only surviving parties are the post-fascists, the post-communists, 
and the Northern League. And in the middle, between center right and center left, you get no man's land. Politicians are under investigation, in jail, so no political class, no party organization. The cultures have been desertified. And Italian parties were much stronger than American parties. They really were the backbone of, a, of the public sphere. And imagine that at the end of 1993, the president of the republic holds a snap election. So in three months' time, you'll have a vote. And the only party that can win is the post-communists, because the only relevant party that has survived all that. And there is a huge electoral space that you can fill. So how can you fill that space in three months? First of all, you have got a firm that has offices everywhere in Italy, because it was not just a television, it was money. They were lending money. So there was all the financing. And I, I have... I remember it very well because in 19, early 1994, I was summoned for a job interview by Fininvest, by Berlusconi's firm. I had got my degree three years before. So why do you, why do you summon me in early 1994? I went in this place and they were all talking politics. And I got the, the very clear impression that my job interview was and really nothing to do. I was doing a PhD in history, so I told them, look, come on, <laughs> why, why do you care about me? Why should I care about you? But why did they summon me? I think there was something political there. So the idea was, you know, you come here, you see what we do, you know, you see that there might be a job for you there. So that was very relevant. So money, the organization of the firm, all the party organization was created on the firm, on the organization of the firm, televisions and leadership. But this is the only way in which you can switch from null to 25% of the vote in three months. So that was, in a way, indispensable. So get out the money, get out the firm, get out the television, you don't have Berlusconi. That being said, if Berlusconi had said things that Italians didn't like, he wouldn't win. So it was the instruments and what you did with the instruments that was crucial. First element. Second element, that being said, in time Berlusconi could have created a proper political party independent of his own personal resources and televisions. He never did it. Because, of course, a proper political party with a proper political class would become independent of his leadership, which he didn't, he didn't want. So he actively prevented anything from growing. He did some party building in the late 90s in order to win the 2001 elections. Then he won the elections, and that's it. So no cultural initiatives, no organization. That remained a party of Silvio Berlusconi. So he, in a way, perpetuated the, the, the dependency of politics on his resources to prevent politics from becoming, from becoming independent. Another crucial element that must be never forgotten is um, when I was saying civil society, the myth of civil society, whatever this means, I agree that in this myth of civil society in the 1980s, there were many things also opposed to each other. So, but that was relevant. There was this idea that the animal spirits of the country were great, that the country was thri thriving, growing, could do incredible things if only politics didn't stop it, didn't thwart it, didn't prevent it from, you know, being creative and great. This creativity, these animal spirits of Italy in the 1980s were expressed by Berlusconi's televisions. The idea that this was uh, the Milan against Rome, R the Italian public television is Rome, is politics, is pedagogical, is top-down, is boring, is trying to teach you how to behave. 
ever less, but this was the original idea behind the Italian public television. It was pedagogical. As famous Bernabe, one of the great directors general of Rai, we must have the Italians get down from the trees. That was the idea. So the, the, the monkeys must become human beings thanks to the television. The, the Pinocchios must become real kids thanks to the television. So that was the original idea. It was, was top-down and pedagogical. Berlusconi's television was certainly not pedagogical at all. I give you what you want, mostly scantily clad women. I mean, so, and entertainment, and, and in a way expressing the animal spirits of Italian society. So Berlusconi could, could build on that. And he was very credible when he, when he presented himself as the expression of civil society was credible because he was the man that had expressed the civil society. As I said, also I have a different idea what civil society should be, <laughs> but never mind. I mean, th this was the slogan and it was credible. Then, of course, there is that the final question is to what extent Berlusconi has been able to change the minds of Italian. To what extent Berlusconi's medias have convinced people to vote for him. Now, I believe that the pattern is more complicated than that. I believe that we cannot accept. What is certain is that people voting for Berlusconi were watching Berlusconi's television. This is the thing, all studies have identified this as the most relevant uh, link between television and political behavior is not how much you look at watch television, but is Berlusconi voters were watching Berlusconi's television. Left wing voters were watching public television. But most studies are showing a rather complicated pattern. It is not that I vote for Berlusconi because I watch Berlusconi's televisions, but I watch Berlusconi's televisions because I vote for Berlusconi. Or better, I both watch Berlusconi's televisions and I vote for Berlusconi because I belong to a certain political culture, because I think in a certain way. Now, it is possible that that way of thinking has been created or reinforced by Berlusconi's televisions, but this is not a shorter mechanism. You know, Friday I watch Berlusconi's television, Sunday I vote for Berlusconi. It's a longer term process of building a certain culture that is a culture of mistrust towards politics, politicians, institutions, and public television. So it's a complicated pattern, I believe very interesting, which is related to a kind of, of circle, what I think, what Berlusconi is giving me, why I'm going in Berlusconi's direction for what, because of what I think, how what I think is reinforced by my watching Berlusconi's televisions, and finally, I vote for Berlusconi. <clears throat> Beppe, can you elaborate on that? But also, you have a, the five million theory, right? That I think is a very interesting theory. I would like you to share with the, with the public here. But that, that was a few years ago. Now the five, five millions club okay. have changed. And, uh, and I may... Can I... Just a small thing about television. Uh, I, as I said before, television is important when things are not going well. It's important, as you say, because they create a culture. It is true. Uh, Berlusconi has used television uh, in order to have a great sort of loudspeaker and a communication tool that was extremely important for him. I have to say that the left has used... Uh, 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 I'm trying to find the right word, disloyally, <laughs> probably, public television for many years. So he gave Berlusconi an excuse to say, look, look what the left, you know, the government as always control television. The government in Italy for many years have been mostly on the center left. And someone, me, including me, said, look, if the government, center left government controls public television, which in Italy is not like public television in the US, 
it's big it's uh, uh, and Berlusconi controls private televisions and he owns three plus channels if Berlusconi wins the election and becomes the government there is one person controlling all of television how about that it's pretty straightforward you know but people oh yes but but nothing you know it, it, it happened so for years we did, we had a, a maybe one channel was left as a kind of just to show that there was a kind of but it was it was hard to criticize the current government because a was owned privately by the prime minister or controlled publicly by the prime minister which was not good i never left a television studio stormed out in my life apart from once it was in 2010, at the height of the of the so-called uh, bunga bunga scandals. There was a, a sexual scandal that has to do with Berlusconi and the way and the girls said he would have a displays and and other things that were going on. The book was out in Italy. I went there, uh, and a news program, the equivalent of a news night or in 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 England or called Matrix. I sat there, I was supposed to be talk about my book, which covered part of this. I, I'm not one that goes on the use this television to attack people with, you know, with sort of hate speech or anything. But so before I was given, you know, the, the podium, there were a, mini a, a female minister who for no with no counterpart, she, she went on and she, for 10 minutes, she explained how Berlusconi was perfect with young women. Then there were two journalists that said Berlusconi was great. And um, then there was a, a video contribution saying that the magistrates were bastards, basically. And sitting next to me, there was an art critic called Vittorio Sgarbi, when it was in a rage, went. And then around 12.30 at night, I was supposed to, to to be given the chance to say. I decided I had enough, so I, I just timed carefully at the end of the video of the of the video contribution so the the, the, the anchor man wouldn't have time to do anything. F a few ten seconds before, because I could see the time, I pull out my microphone, left it there, and walk out of the studio. And he said, now, after all this, what let's see what Beppe Severnini has to say. And there was an empty chair with the microphone there. And Hortensia, my wife, is here. Our son, who's, uh, who's 24, like Giovanni, over there. And my son, who never watched me on television, said, Dad, that was cool. So the first time I had my own son saying that, yeah, that he, I was not there. So he really enjoyed me on television the moment when I left an empty chair. But I did, because the whole thing was, was embarrassing. So when... when when the chips are down, television matters. When things are you're, you're on a winning streak, you've just been elected, things calm down. But that and that happened in Italy, and I know I know this country is completely different. The five million club, the five million club is the is the people that never voted for Berlusconi, and uh, or some of them did, but did. Um, Numerically, were not too important. The five million, I worked out, but we're talking about like what, five, six, eight years ago, that the number of people watching satellite television were five million, the people reading newspaper in Italy, five million, the people going to see certain kind of films uh, were five million, the people uh, going into bookstore were five million. So I, it, it occurred to me that there were the same five million people. And Berlusconi, smartly, because the man, the man is the exceptional in his perception, intuition, ability. We're not talking about like a like a, a joke. We're talking about an extremely talented person. Uh, cynical, whatever. Uh, I think he is economical with the truth. How do you like that? <laughs> Very economical with the truth. Uh, but uh, he couldn't care less about the five million club. He gave up about the five million club. Who cares, these people? And they were not left, deaf, they were not your left wing. They were not all people that would vote the Democratic Party in this country or for the Italian Democratic Party or for, no, not at all. Uh, they were a mix of people. Uh, 
that would include uh, media people, academics, and so on and so forth. And the final tiny, tiny points about money and power. You're right, Giovanni. The people who own the newspapers and media in Italy always had an, an agenda. Telev government and television, we discussed that. Uh, Corriere della Sera, La Stampa, Fiat Automobiles, they control La Stampa and partly Corriere della Sera and the people in Rome, um, sort of real estate interest control Messaggero. But you see, there is always something in between. The money, the power, the publisher, of course it's much better to have a publisher who does that as a job. But non nonetheless, you got the money and the power controlling the media, and then you have the government. But once you have everything in one person, that is the problem. Although Gianni Agnelli was probably the most powerful person in Italy, but there was something in between. There was a little, a little something, there was a little space, a room to discuss, to stop, to the, the, the murder in Britain. I think he has a big responsibility for what happened with Brexit, with popular press, with the boy press in Britain. And I think if they, if uh, you see what, what Theresa May did, said yesterday in Florence, I think they're really worried and they don't know exactly which way to go. And I think Rupert Murdoch, an Australian tycoon, had a lot of responsibility because he relentlessly spoke <laughs> against Europe. And of course, the other side didn't speak didn't speak with passion for Europe. In Europe, you must know, I'm talking to the Americans here, that the only people in the last few years that spoke with passions about Europe were the enemies of Europe. And that, that's why they had s s the, the first politicians that spoke with some warmth towards Europe was Macron in France, and not surprisingly, he, there was a, 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 a political mileage in there. For, for, for years in Britain, the tabloid press and, the, and all the, the, they were all for leave, leave, leave and against Europe, uh, insulting and, and, and uh, Europe at every step of the way. And on the other side, you have a very lukewarm defense of Europe as a lesser evil by the government. The results we know. But I brought up Murdoch, and then I'll stop here, because Rupert Murdoch has got, in my view, too much influence on uh, British politics, and there were uh, newspapers, and, and uh, not only newspapers, television, radio, websites in this country, we can discuss. But after all, they're not the Prime Minister. Rupert Murdoch is not sitting in Downing Street, okay? Uh, the Almost, because he appointed No, never, never mind, minister. but it's not, there is something in between. The moment you have the big tycoon publisher, owner of the media, sitting, there is nothing to stop him or her, him. No, no, I, I agree on this. One of my favorite lines is that Berlusconi is a vertically integrated version of the U.S. government because there is no, nothing in between. He owns his member of parliament, he owns his ministry, he owns... Here in the States, there is a little bit of hypocrisy. You are a member of a particular firm just the second before you are Secretary of Treasury and just the second after. But during the time that you are there, allegedly, you are not linked to that firm. Yeah, so, he had a smaller version of Bannon as well, like several. <laughs> but um, I want to move a bit uh, ahead with the consequences. Um, I saw uh, a few years back a movie that I strongly recommend you, uh, even if it's, at least for me it was very painful, so painful that at some point my wife said, we don't have to watch this movie. It's called Videocracy and represents sort of uh, uh, the influence that Berlusconi had on the cultural values of Italy. And uh, for me, it was particularly painful because I'm the same generation as, as Giovanni. I left Italy in, in 88 when uh, they were at the beginning of uh, this uh, uh, private TV. And, uh, and, you know, as a young teenager, you see some uh, uh, half-naked woman on the video after you have not seen one ever. So that's good. And I thought that was sort of uh, progress and competition and variety. And then sort of this videocracy shows what is as made of uh, the values in Italy. And the thing that was particularly shocking was that there was this guy that uh, wanted to become a dancer or, or a Van Damme of, of Italy uh, on the public, t on the Berlusconi TV, but they said, oh, 
if you are required to, uh, to have sex to make it, said, oh, yeah, I will consider. That's part of uh, the trade-off that one have to, to pay. So, um, and this was uh, like a mechanic or some uh, simple person that uh, was considering that. So I want to sort of, uh, um, and, and I think that that's a concern in this country as well. And it's just, uh, this country has not seen uh, some uh, sort of open episode of uh, sexual harassment, of uh, racism, etc., um, pardon and, and tolerate it in the way they are recently. So um, what, what is the, if you want, cultural legacy of 20 years of uh, uh, Berlusconi mm-hmm. in power? Uh, the general remark is that I, I, I don't think that we should uh, overemphasize his impact. I mean, I think he did have an impact. I think it was a relevant impact, but uh, we cannot believe that this person was able to reshape Italian culture, of course. What he did, certainly, was to build on trends that were already, that had already started, amplify them, reinforce them, and then, of course, also take his own political and business benefit from them. So I... I think that uh, you know there is there is o- often this kind this tendency you know to to put all the sins of Italy at the door of Berlusconi. I mean there are many many are there, but we cannot imagine that a single man uh, is able to to change so deeply or to put a country of 60 million people on an entirely different track. What we can believe is that he was you know. The country was already on that specific track, and he was actually pushing it along. Certainly, uh, I, I have this very clear memory of what it meant to have private television in Italy, starting from the late 70s. And I, I very well remember switching from being a kid that had only two channels, public channels, to the remote control. I remember the epiphany of the remote control and the possibility of actually switching from one channel to the other and the incredible sense of freedom and the possibility to choose that as a 10, 12 years old I, I, I had at the, end, uh, uh, at the end of the 1970s. Of course, being that age, I could not believe, I could not think about what now I know, that the level of the private television was in going down and it was very, very, very low. And that boring public television was, a matter of fact, on another level. Uh, so I couldn't perceive that this was also increasing the, uh, you know, the, possibly the trend of vulgarization of television. On the other hand, you know, freedom, vulgarization. No, it's, it's a complicated trade-off. We know that, and I'm not so sure I... Uh, I want to opt for a, a less free system if it is also less vulgar. I mean, it's, it's a complicated thing. Berlusconi was part and parcel of all that. He was a major player and certainly is, uh, as a politician then later on in the 1990s, his, his message, you know, you can do whatever you want because the rules, politics, is suffocating your freedom, uh, was a kind of, you know, rules don't matter, do whatever you want. Uh, I mean, if you say that Italy's taxation is too high, which it certainly is, and uh, that you want to lower it, uh, and that Italy's taxation is too high, and this means it is bad. Uh, it is very bad, and I understand those who don't pay taxes because taxation is too high. So this is a very dangerous message, because if you then say, I have lowered taxes, so now please you must pay them because I've lowered them, is one thing. If you say taxation is bad, it is too high, I want to lower it, and then you don't lower it, what is left is the message that taxation is bad. So it's basically is an aim to tax evasion, bottom line. And uh, the uh the message gets very de- dangerous message when it comes to civic culture to civic culture and certainly this is one of the major outcomes of berlusconi now 
as I say, I don't believe he created anything. I believe he reinforced things. He reinforced trends that were already there in a kind of vicious circle, building on that and reinforcing that. One last remark, which I believe is absolutely crucial. One of the most dangerous vicious circle that Berlusconi reinforced is the vicious circle of anti-politics. He was born out of anti-politics, the 1992-93 political crisis, politicians are useless, politics is damaging, parties are useless. This, and he built on that, and then he reinforced that, saying and continuously saying that politics as a separate activity with its own rules, its own uh, outcomes, is terrible, is useless. And this put Italy into a very dangerous path of anti-politics that then led to very different kinds of anti-politics, technocratic anti-politics, Monti's government, the common man anti-politics, which is the Five Star Movement, and this is part of the political crisis Italy is in today which is the political crisis of a country that does not recognize politics as something that has any value and is not ready to give politics the resources that politics needs. Money, power, time, without which politics is totally useless, is paralyzed. And I believe this is one of the most dangerous effects of Berlusconi. Once again, not created, but reinforced by him. Beppe. I think Giovanni made a really good point. Uh, he was a pioneer in many ways, Berlusconi. We're talking someone who realized early in the 1990s that something was going to change. He's got the gut instinct of a politician, and he saw it coming. There were not many similar, uh, maybe Rospero up to a point, but it didn't get very far in this country. But there were not very many examples around the world in the early 90s of what he achieved. But then something happened. Let me introduce another. That's why I don't think his legacy will last very long, because Berlusconi is an analogical leader, is an analogical PPP, powerful populist politicians. So analogical. The moment the internet and, and, and the social media stepped in, we're talking about the last 10 years, basically, for, for good. Berlusconi coinciding is not a complete coincidence. Of course, his age has to do with it, with Berlusconi's decline. I think Berlusconi doesn't get the internet at all. He doesn't get it. He doesn't know what it is. He doesn't think it's important. Google. Uh, Trump will, uh, Google becomes Google. No, I was, uh, <laughs> I was going to say Sorry Trump. To he said Google, I say Trump will. Interesting. Uh, he, the current American president does the way he uses Twitter, or at least he does know enough to surround himself with people who, who use the internet in the way we do, and it's not the, the re what we are here to talk about today. So I'll, I'll, start, I'll leave it here. Berlusconi doesn't know is not interested and is surrounded by people who do not get it and they are not interested. They are all analogical leadership, completely. Uh, he's got some advisors, but his advisor, I say, Berlusconi in a few days on September 29th is going to be 81. And uh, there are people who are 81 really follow all this stuff, but not many, and his advisors don't get it. If you take, uh, I don't know, his lawyer, counselor, Nicolò Ghedini, Renato Brunetta, names that Italians know, but probably most American uh, in this room, most Americans don't know. Even these people don't, are not really into the internet, use the social media, uh, creating trends and using the all, you know, uh, micro-targeting, all of that is beyond him. He's analogical. The man is completely analogical, not only he doesn't have a success. He didn't never wanted to create a, a, a legacy or a successor. He appointed probably ten to twelve successors. The Italians again in this room know some of the name: Gianfranco Fini, Angelino Alfano, Giulio Tremonti. A long, long list. He would keep 
them for a few years and then drop them. Because Berlusconi is like Kurtz. You remember Kurtz in Heart of Darkness that then became Apocalypse Now? He's that kind of leader. He's surround, he needs to be surrounded by, he's got an enormous charisma. And a, and a kind of strange and some dark side to it. He's surrounded by people that adore him and they're ready to everything to defend him, protect him. But Colin a Kurtz, he never created a Kurtz school up to in the in the Congo River. Can you imagine a Kurtz school? No, there cannot be a Berlusconi school. And I think that's that's also that's also important. Uh, you have a a man who's old. It's uh, we, Berlusconi doesn't hold press conferences. He's very well managed by himself, first of all, by his people around him. But the only reason why he got back, and let me close with the image, but it's not an image I thought about carefully. The mammoth images, something that belongs to another era, happened to be frozen in ice, and then something happened, and it's defrosted all of a sudden, and he's free. And he wanders around, a little clumsy, you know, the, 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 the political mammoth. Here I am again. And in fact, here he is again. But he's a mammoth. And now the savanna is full of faster animals. Thank you. This brings to actually my, my last question and probably the most difficult one. In a sense, uh, how to fight a populist plutocrat? Uh, one is with age, but that takes a long time. Uh, <laughs> So is there a strategy that works? Because um, looking at uh, the United States, we see a lot of strategies that don't work. And uh, I would like to see sort of, uh, can we learn from Italy some strategies that do work? Great work, great question. Difficult one, then you go first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, no, um, I think that's uh, trying to, to look at the, I mean, you know, this is, um, an historian's uh, deform professional deformation, looking at the origins, looking at why he's around, what kind of, of questions he's addressing, I think is a, is a first element. So taking him, and Beppe was saying this before, take him seriously. These are no jokes. I mean, people who get millions of votes cannot be jokes. If people are voting for this kind of persons, this must be, there are, of course, we can go on for, for, for years saying what has become of politics, what has become of voters. Uh, people are voting with emotions, not with rationality. And so what's happening to democracy? We can go on, but if we need a political strategy, we must do a political strategy in what democracy is today, not what we would like it to be. Demonization is a wrong strategy, I believe, because demoni I mean, these people are not the infection, they are the fever. If you demonize them, uh, is trying to destroy the fever, but the infection is there and it's going to get back sometime, maybe in another form, maybe in a worse form. So, of course, you can say, I stop the fever now, but, and then I cure the infection. You can do that, but you need to have a cure. You cannot just stop at demonization, which is what the Italian left did for, for two decades. Ah, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, but they couldn't actually speak to the Italians, to Berlusconi's voters, and every time they spoke to Berlusconi's voters, they alienated them. So it was better when they didn't try even to speak to them. So take them seriously. Try to understand what kind of demands they are addressing and try and find another way to address those questions. Try and find, if it is possible, try to, to give a different answer and do not alienate the voters. Don't be arrogant. Don't take a stand of moral superiority. Don't say, you know, the bunch of deplorables. That's, that's <laughs> terrible. That's absolutely terrible. The, when, you know, the bunch of depl deplorables quip. When, when I heard that, uh, 25 years of Italian politics just came home to me. I've, that quip in Italy has been repeated countless times, always destroying the political fortune of the people uttering that kind of statement. Doesn't work, absolutely not. It's very difficult, but you must do politics. You must understand people, get back to them, and try to give more credible answers to the same questions. 
it's tough, takes time. And, uh, but I think, I think that's, that's the only answer, the only real answer uh, for that kind of, 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 of challenge. Beppe. I think it um, has a lot to do with sort of, I think psychologists and anthropologists and other uh, are the ones that probably are better suited to answer this question more than journalists or maybe or academics or historians or economists. And not, we are here, we are an economist and historian and a journalist, because I think it has to do with people's mind. This is my magazine, this is the latest issue, it's about, it's about Come ragionano i Cinque Stelle? What is how they work? The mind of a five-star movement voters. How does that work? The second, in the in next issue, we have the neo Berlusconiano, so the voter for Berlusconi, and we do with respect. It's not we don't have a political agenda. We ask young a young writer, a writer, a a, in a fiction writer to sort of try to explain and write a respect to how does it work, the mind of a voter of Berlusconi, five-star movement, and, and I think maybe that is a way. Empathy, it's important. Too many politicians forgot that. People, voters, of all kind, all men and women, young and old, south and north, and you name it, need Asia and Europe need empathy, need to, to see that they, they share some emotion, sense of humor sometimes, no patronizing, and take your populist opponent, as I said many already, and you kindly picked up, seriously, not literally. If you think of Hillary Clinton, I think the mistakes were no empathy, oh, but I had, if I were an American voter, I would never, a doubt in the world, I would have voted for them, Hillary Clinton, me, Beppe, unimportant, but I had no doubt who was the better choice. But I have to admit, as, in a, as, as an observer and a journalist, that this, she was lacking this for empathy, humor, no patronizing, and she sounded patronizing, not admitting that some background was not too different, but and it took him literally and not seriously. And finally, and even more important, remember, all political leaders in in any anywhere in the world, but definitely in the in the Western democracy, so all of Western Europe, America, and elsewhere, should remember that people are worried. The difference in salaries are becoming offensive in this country, in Europe, in many places, between having a bunch of young people who study hard and they, uh, a goal is to make 1,500 euro a month is offensive for them, for the families, for the effort, for whatever. So these things are creating a, a mass of discontent that someone is ready to exploit. So the first thing, the, everything, you know, empathy, humor, well, no patronage, it's important, but this is even more important. As you rightly said, Giovanni, they are the fever. They are not the illness. And so you have to cure the illness because losers, and not I use, I use losers not in the, in the sense of, you know, oh, you losers, but people who, are, who feel they are losing seek scapegoats and seek revenge. And in order to get their revenge, they'll pick whoever is around, even Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fantastic panel. I'm sorry that we ran out of time, but I'm sure that uh, these lessons will be used uh, in, in the following uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for your patience.